In the previous episode, we showed how implementing a single entry point begins with the binding step, where we connect our scripts. But what is the ultimate way to do this with multiple classes in an industry-level project? We all started our journey as Unity developers using Unity's built-in methods, enjoying the innocence of life. For instance, all the find family or the get component family. But after a while, we notice it becomes harder to understand from what object the reference came from. We get exceptions at runtime because we accidentally got the wrong reference. And if we overuse them in performant critic scenarios, like in an update function, we also enjoy some performance issues. So the next step in the evolution is to start using tightly bound techniques that receive a direct reference to a script without any surprises. The most basic method is by serializing a field and attaching to it the desired script in the inspector. By combining this with the single entry point pattern and attaching all objects in our scene to a single reference container, we already start to have the backbones of a clean, resistant to errors architecture. But how can our scripts get a reference to this container? One of the most debatable solutions to this problem is the singleton pattern. For those unfamiliar, singleton is one of the 23 legendary design patterns. To create it, we just need a class with a private constructor which exposes a public static instance of itself. This way, all of its properties can be accessed effortlessly from anywhere in our code. Now, if we want our container to be a singleton, we need to initialize it in an awake method and mark it as don't destroy on load. Note that the only restriction is that we can have just one instance of this class, which is fine since we want a single container anyway. Awesome, we created our first legit bindings, though it has other problems, which we'll encounter soon. A design pattern equivalent to singleton, which is entirely dedicated to Unity, is the scriptable object architecture pattern, or SOAP in short. SOAP suggests that rather than holding all our references in a static class, we make it a scriptable object instead. And because scriptable objects are available across scenes, we can use it from anywhere in our game. Now, to be honest, these two patterns are super convenient. They are easy to use, have great performance, and are fast to implement and iterate with, making them our go-to in every game jam. And even famous titles like Clash of Clans rely heavily on singletons. So why is everyone always saying singletons are bad? Singleton has one huge problem. It simply doesn't scale. As of its nature, singleton is static, which means everything it holds is always kept in memory, only being disposed once our game is closed. Think that our main menu data is still being kept even during gameplay, wasting our precious memory. Everything is always accessible, even when it shouldn't be. Imagine being asked to show a special offer pop-up during gameplay. Since your code allows it, you won't realize it's not actually possible until you try it and it fails. Singleton doesn't offer any coupling protection. Everything can be accessed from anywhere, leading to tightly coupled classes and messy dependencies, potentially looking something like this. For a scalable commercial game, we need to bind our classes cautiously with barriers that limit the developer's freedom and protecting the code base from becoming a mess. For this, we have the Object Resolver. From now on, everything shown in this video can be found in our industry-level sample project, available on our Patreon. Your support truly helps us keep this channel free for everyone. The Object Resolver is a simple yet effective design pattern. It holds a single dictionary that maps each type to its instance, allowing us to register and unregister to it any instance we want, and of course, exposes the option to get an instance by its type. So now in our container, we can register our instances to the Object Resolver, which can then be injected into our scripts so they can use it to get any reference they need. It may look now like we overcomplicated things. To get a reference, we need an object resolver that holds all our references. We then need to register each class to it and finally pass manually this object resolver to each of our classes. But no worries, we'll improve this soon. But first, let's take a look at the advantages it gives us. Since our object resolver uses a dynamic dictionary, during runtime in our exit point, we can unregister references, managing smartly our game's memory and prevent access to redundant classes as we saw earlier with singletons. Also, we can now limit specific access to our classes. For instance, let's decide that any view object in our game must implement the iView interface, which will be used by our view factory to pass only the audio service and camera service into our view object, preventing our views from accessing core services. 
This kind of setup already gives our code base a great improvement, creating a waterfall of specific dependencies being passed down our classes. The only downside of resolving manually is that we lost our convenient autocomplete, and now we have to use the old-fashioned remember it in our brains tool to access our classes, which is a small sacrifice we are willing to take. So the object resolver beats Singleton without a struggle, but we can add on top of it the final functionality layer to achieve a fully supervised code base Dependency Injection Don't confuse it with Dependency Inversion and Solid, they are two separated things. For those unfamiliar, Injection says that instead of a class retrieving a parameter internally by itself, with a singleton for example, it's passed externally by another class. So with Dependency Injection, this parameter is as it sounds, a dependency to another class which we need a reference to. This way, we can upgrade our object resolver to use a bit of reflection magic and some smart caching so it will inject automatically every type we want. Here we chose to provide them through the constructor, allowing our classes to receive automatically the relevant references they need. Getting rid of resolving manually. Now, if you're like us, want to avoid using reflection, here's a pro tip for you. Since we know in advance the signatures of our classes, we can cache the reflections output in advance for much better performance. And this improvement is just the tip of the iceberg. We can add support for resolving by interfaces, scriptable object injection, binding with custom parameters, and much more. So if you prefer turning our lightweight object resolver into a fully functional DI system, it might take ages. The good news is that there are great out-of-the-box tools like vContainer or Zenject. We know it's a good practice to avoid relying on third parties, but from our experience, these two are worth it. They are flexible, convenient, and there's a good reason why many game titles use them. We are not going to go in this video into full detail on which is better. But after years of using them both, we can summarize that vContainer is faster, while Zenject has more features, but stopped being maintained. Anyways, both are linked in the description. So how can dependency injection help us? DI provides easy separation of our code into contexts. In Zenject, for example, every scene has its scene context. Here we define on which other context this scene depends on. For instance, we can separate our scenes into two. Core, which will include general classes like audio service or scene loader service. And gameplay, which will include gameplay dedicated scripts like the player controller or the enemy spawner. And of course, we will be loading them on top of each other additively, so they will live simultaneously in our game. Then, in our gameplay scene, we'll allow access to the core context, but of course our isolated core scene won't have access the other way around. This way, if we accidentally try from within a core script to get a reference to a gameplay script, we'll get a runtime exception, keeping our dependency flow safe. But we can do better. We can improve our protection by receiving this error even earlier during the compilation process by using assembly definitions. An assembly is a collection of scripts which are built together, usually with common functionality. For example, if we dive into our game's build files, we can see how Unity separates its code base into different assemblies, each with its own DLL file. In Unity by default, all our custom scripts sit under one giant assembly. This way, they can all reference each other. As showed earlier, a script in our core context can access scripts which are from the gameplay context, although it will get an exception at runtime. But by separating our scripts into assembly definitions, for example, one for core, and the other for the gameplay, and of course only let the gameplay reference the core. Our core script will get a compilation error, since it has no reference to scripts in the gameplay assembly, significantly increasing our code protection. And of course with Singleton, this separation isn't possible, since we have only one container that must reference them all. So now, after implementing context and assembly definitions, our code base is perfectly separated into clusters of classes, each cluster divided into subclusters that are all in a waterfall. Isn't that just beautiful? Dependency injection has a bug, which is also a feature. It doesn't allow circular dependencies. Circular dependencies is the main ingredient in delicious spaghetti code. The most basic case is when two classes have references to each other, but it can easily extend into a chain of three or more. At its core nature, when DI injects dependencies and reaches circular dependencies, it halts to avoid entering an infinite injection loop. This limitation is exactly what we want, and it even tells us in detail the circular dependencies chain it found. 
We honestly can't count how many times this saved us. After eliminating circular dependencies between classes, our code base finally reaches its final form. But we forgot to mention, circular dependencies are also not allowed between assembly definitions, and Zenject prevents circular dependencies between our contexts as well. Now we are fully protected from any angle and from any reckless developer. Only we are getting goosebumps? We hope we've convinced you to give dependency injection a try. Though don't be fooled, it isn't easier or more convenient. Like everything in code, it comes with trade-offs, but in our opinion, it's totally worth it. Enjoyed the video? Share it with your friends, and show us that love with a thumbs up and subscribe. And thanks a lot for watching. We hope to see you soon in another Practic API video.